In the previous video, I defined linear combinations, spans, and linear independence. A major theme of this course is the connection of algebra and geometry. So in this video, I'm going to talk about some geometric structures I can build with linear combinations, and how the ideas of span and linear independence work in geometry. And this helps me to give some very important intuition about these very abstract ideas. The first definition is a linear subspace. A linear subspace is a subset L of some Rn with two properties. First, for any two vectors in the subset, the sum of the two vectors must also be in the subset. Second, for any vector u in the subset, and for any scalar whatsoever a, the multiple au must also be in the set. You hopefully remember that these two operations, sums and scalar multiples, were the algebraic ideas tied to the term linear. Therefore, it makes sense to, that this L is called a linear subspace. It is a subset that satisfies the properties of linearity. It works well with addition and scalar multiplication. It's also common to say that L is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. A little note on the terminology here. I say subset for any subset of Rn. However, the term subspace is used for special subsets, such as linear subspaces. If you were wondering what was going on with the set space thing here, hopefully that clarifies it a bit. Now, what does this definition mean? Well, since it is made with linear operations, geometrically it leads to flat objects. Linear subspaces are lines, planes, and other higher dimensional versions of flat objects. Since I can scale by any scalar, they are infinitely extended lines and planes. They don't stop anywhere, but continue outwards forever. Also, since I can take a equals zero in the scalar multiplication, the zero vector is always in a subspace. That is, they are lines and planes that go through the origin. I've mentioned a bit already that mathematicians really like our trivial cases, our base cases. What is the smallest subspace? Well, I just said that they must include the origin. So the smallest subspace is just the set containing the origin. And it does actually satisfy the definition. It only has the zero vector, so any addition is just adding the zero vector to itself, which is still zero. And likewise, any scalar multiplication is something times zero, which remains zero, so it is a linear subspace. What if I wanted a subspace that didn't go through the origin? Well, like I did with spans in the last video, I can add an offset vector. An affine subspace is a linear subspace with an offset. I can write this as A, the affine subspace, as V plus L, where V is the offset and L is a linear subspace. In the previous video, I talked a little about this strange notation. What this means is that I add the fixed vector V to every vector in L, all infinitely many, to get a new set of vectors. The result of this construction is lines and planes that may no longer go through the origin, and in this way any line, plane, or higher dimensional infinite flat object can be described as an affine subspace. Finally, since the origin itself, just a point at the origin, is a linear subspace, I can offset the origin to any other point, so any isolated point is also an affine subspace. All right, now let me connect the two ideas of this and the previous video. Perhaps you've already guessed, but these linear and affine subspaces are nothing more than the geometric interpretation of the previous spans and offset spans. A linear subspace is a span, and a span is a linear subspace. An affine subspace is an offset span, and an offset span is an affine subspace. I can understand spans by thinking about subspaces, and I can calculate subspaces using the algebra of spans. And this is one of the key algebra geometry connections in this course. A linear subspace is a point, a line, a plane, or something similar in higher dimensions. It makes sense to talk about the dimension of a linear subspace. A point should have dimension 0, a line dimension 1, a plane dimension 2, and so on. Using spans, how can I understand this? I can use the idea of linear independence. Remember that I said that vectors were linearly independent if they all fundamentally had different directions. Well, that's the key. A linear subspace has dimension k 
by definition, if it can be written as the span of k linearly independent vectors, and the same is true for an affine subspace, writing it as an offset span. The offset doesn't affect the dimension at all, it just moves the object somewhere. These k linearly independent vectors are called a basis for the linear subspace. The linear subspace is the span of its basis. So the basis is called the spanning set for the subspace. It produces the subspace by taking all linear combinations. And that's what span means, remember? A spanning set is a basis if it is minimal, if it is the smallest collection of vectors that can span the subspace. Note that a basis is not unique. Linear subspaces have many bases, but they're all minimal since they all have the same number of vectors and that number is the dimension. A line is the span of one vector. It has a basis of one vector. A plane is the span of two independent vectors, has a basis of two vectors, and so on. And let me finish with talking about bases for Euclidean space itself. R2 has a standard basis of the axis vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1. The usual notation for these is E1 and E2. Any vector can be written as a linear combination of E1 and E2. Take 11, 5, for example. 11, 5 is 11 times E1 and plus 5 times E2. Indeed, any vector is its first coordinate times E1 plus its second coordinate times E2. So all of R2 can be built from E1 and E2 E1 and E2 span R2, and they are linearly independent, so they form a basis. However, they are not the only basis. Any other two vectors which are linearly independent and span all of R2 are a basis. The vectors 2, 2, and 1, negative 1 are a basis. I won't prove it here, but as an example, the vector 11, 5 can be written as a linear combination. It's equal to 4 times 2, 2, plus 3 times 1, negative 1. And I'll leave you to check the arithmetic if you wish. Any other vector can be expressed this way. So 2, 2 and 1, negative 1 are also a basis. There is a standard basis for R3 as well, which is also the axis vectors and is also written with the notation E1, E2, and now E3. Any vector is a linear combination of these three. For example, 5, negative 6, negative 9 is 5 times E1, plus negative 6 times E2, plus negative 9 times E3. And any other vector has a similar construction where the constants are just the first, second, and third coordinates. Like R2, R3 has many other bases I could construct. Note throughout here that I'm saying bases as the plural of basis. This is the standard way to say the plural. Finally, any Rn has the same standard basis, written E1, E2, up to En. Having this standard basis to refer to is pretty useful for a number of proofs and applications for this course. So do remember, because I will refer back to it.